Last week as we began the book of Amos, I told you that I really hate the Amos is so long and the story, we, we can't get all the story unfolded so you can see the complete picture of what the Lord is saying uh, through the visions in, in one setting, in one Bible study hour. And, I, and, and we can't even come to a conclusion of the storyline and we had to leave hanging ourselves hanging last week in the middle of the storyline. Last week the Lord had said, uh, I, I want to tell you about uh, the visions or had Amos tell about visions that he had seen uh, concerning Israel and Judah and the surrounding nations around those two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And some of them were just downright destructive visions. The destruction is going to come. And, and all I could do last week is show you the vision about, say, to Damascus and tell you when its fulfillment would be. And then the one about to Ammon and the one to Egypt and all that. I could just to tell you the fulfillment. <clears throat> and then we got into the meat of the passage where the Lord is saying, Listen, Israel, I want to tell you, you could not have come out from Egypt had I not done that for you. You could not have survived in the wilderness for 40 years had I not done that for you. You don't even remember everything that I have done for you, Israel, and you are an ungodly people. Now, when is Amos saying these? Amos is saying these messages of the Lord sometime between 801 and 778 B.C. It's a 23-year period. It's two years after the, two years before the earthquake, but we don't know where the earthquake falls in this time period. We just know it's in this time period, but we don't know where. So uh, we really don't know exactly uh, a time, but we can be within 23 years of it. And he's saying, look, you don't remember. Well, let's go back. Okay, 1775 B.C., Jacob moves from Bethel to Egypt with his family. 430 years later, 1445, they come out of Egypt. They couldn't have come out of Egypt under the rule of the Pharaoh had the Lord not done it. They go out into the wilderness. They couldn't survive in the wilderness had the Lord not provided for them at all. 966, 480 years to the day after they come out of the Exodus, Solomon begins building the temple. Seven and a half years later, the temple is completed and Solomon consecrates the temple. All these dates are important in today's lesson. 938 B.C., Solomon dies, the kingdom's divided. And by this time, Solomon has led the entire kingdom of Israel down the path of unrighteousness and ungodliness. And he has married all these wives who, that are foreign wives, that are Canaanite wives, Ethiopian wives, nation, Jordan wives, just wives from all over. And they've all brought their gods in that they want to worship. And Solomon has allowed their gods to be worshipped along with the Jehovah God. And Solomon did not continue in the worship of the one true God like his father David had done. So by this time, 738, he dies. The kingdom's divided to a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom. Spin on down a hundred and so years, and Amos is bringing a message. But it's not a new message. Everything we hear here, we've heard from some other prophets, and we hear, we'll hear it, have heard it all the way back to the consecration of the temple. We've heard it all the way back from the book of um, Exodus. Uh, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. We've heard it back here. There's no real new message here. It's just a repeating of the message. And Amos is delivering it here. And finally, 56 or more years later, wherever this message, at least 56 plus years later, the fall of the northern uh, kingdom occurs and it fulfills most of the prophecies that are proclaimed here. Why is the fall coming? Because Israel has forgotten God. Now, you know, we do this kind of opposite than Israel. Israel, who has forgotten God, that is the leadership of Israel as they lead the people to worship God, but they have forgotten the God that they are worshiping. Did you follow that? Did you understand that? They're doing all these religious things, they're doing the sacrifices. In fact, they're even bringing the bread that's supposed to be brought ever so many days. But they're bringing bread that's not leaven, uh, unleavened bread any longer. They're bringing regular bread, which is not following the statutes. 
It's not following the laws. Last week's lesson, the Lord says, This is what I have against you. You do not keep my laws, you do not keep my statutes, and you do not worship me and me only. I've got this against you. And for these transgressions, I'm going to bring punishment upon you if you don't change. <clears throat> you know, most of us, we do this exactly opposite than, than what's in the Scripture here. We grow up, about the time we're five, six, or seven, for a lot of us, our parents were so worried about whether we were saved or not, they go down, we say the right words, we um, uh, get baptized, and then the, the parents can go, okay, that's off my bucket list. My kids are saved. And then later on, the kids usually have a personal relationship and encounter with God somewhere down the road. Happened to me that way. Six years old. So scared that my parents were so scared they were going to die or something happened before I got saved. So I got, went down to the front of the aisle. I said the right words. I want to be saved. The preacher told me all about it. I shook my head up and down. I didn't understand a thing he said. But I still got baptized. I can remember the baptism, but I didn't get saved. I didn't get saved until I was 11 when I had an encounter with God. Then is when I got saved. <laughs> then, even though I had an encounter with God... I didn't pray to God. I, didn't, I went through college not praying to God. I thought God was up there. God's just up there. I mean, He's busy doing something. I don't know what He's doing, but He's got to be busy with doing something. And surely God doesn't interact in personal lives today. Had I known in college what I know today, I'd have been praying every day. Because when I am in a relationship with God, I am making good decisions because I'm finding out what God's will is because it just, He speaks to my heart to know what He wants to happen. Well, back in college, uh, I was just, you know, making the best choices I could based on the crisis of the moment. There were a lot of crises of the moment back in this college age. In fact, in high school age too. And had I known back then what I know now, of how I seek everything of the Lord's will, uh, what He wants, and I get in on that, the blessings just roll down. Uh, whenever I try to make my own decision, the blessings don't come. Why? Because usually I find out, oh, that was a bad decision. I wasn't supposed to do that. In fact, um, I've made kind of fun about it. I used to fly airplanes a lot. And uh, uh, there's a place over here at Hobby called Millionaire that, Back when I was flying, I probably flew in there a hundred times or more. And when you come in, you come in in bad weather, flying into Houston area. Uh, you may not be able to get into any other airport, but for some reason, because of the way Hobby sits, you can always fly into Hobby uh, VFR. That means you're not instrument. You can get underneath the clouds and you can fly and get in safe. And I'd fly in there. I'd rent a car at Millionaire and I'd drive over to Spring Break, drive home, then come back the next day, turn the car in, and, and fly back to the regular airport because I was socked in. I couldn't. I couldn't get home. <clears throat> and uh, I've off, I thought ever, you know, I stopped flying a long time ago and I, and I got this urge that I want to fly again. Just came up about four or five weeks ago. I want to fly again. And so last Thursday I had the opportunity to go to Millionaire again and pick up some people that are coming in from Oklahoma, take them to the hospital. And I walked in and I said, has the Angel Air flight uh, shown up? And she goes, what tail number was it? And I went, oh, oh, tail number. Oh, I forgot about tail numbers. That's the, in, the number on the end of the airplane. You know, what's the ending number? So we'll know which one's coming in. Because you don't come in by angel air. It's by a tail number. And then I sat down, and I was early, and the plane was late. And, I, in, and I'm watching all the stuff you don't get to see when you fly out on a commercial airline. They're talking about filling up with fuel, and this tire, and that tire, and a fuel pump, and this. And they're moving the stuff around, and I'm inside, I'm crushing inside going, Oh, I don't want to be back in this. No, this is not God's will for me. He spoke to me as clear as day. I don't want you flying again. Just as clear as day. Just knew it. Walked in and I just sickness covered all over me. Because I've been thinking about buying. Because they've got a new little airplane. This is a neat thing. I mean, this thing, this thing, you pull, you fly in, and you punch a little button, and within 30 seconds the wings fold up. 
It's street legal, drives 90 miles an hour, 35 miles a gallon. You drive it home and park it in your garage. <laughs> Go look it up. It's called the Transition Aircraft. That they, MIT, folks from MIT developed it. It came out in, they, they test flew it in 09. It's got airbags it's for when you're driving. It'll drive 70 miles an hour. Just whew. And when, if you happen to be in the air and you have trouble, it's got a uh, explosive parachute that shoots out the back of the airplane and lets the airplane float down. Unbelievable. Just, this is stuff of, 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 of cartoons of the past. And I'm looking at it and I have drool coming down the side of both of my mouths. And I'm thinking, I need this. I need this. Yes. And the, I was. I was lusting. That's exactly what it was. And I show up at the airport and I walk in thinking about that and I'm watching everything because I've been in that life. And I go, oh, no. Uh-uh. Oh, uh-uh. No, don't pass the pan. No, don't pass the pan. No. Don't pass the bucket. No. God speaks to you and you go about, and, you, and, and listen, whenever that happens in you, you don't continue on. When you, when you feel that crushing inside in your heart and you know it's not what God wants for you, you stop. I'm close enough to God, I know that's what he means. Exactly what he means. Well, Israel never got the message. From the very beginning back here, he gave them, he selected them. They were chosen people. They didn't get the message. In fact, they don't get the message either, any lo- it, 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 even when Amos has given it to us. Pick up here. Hear the word which the Lord has spoken. In the first two chapters, it was concerning Israel. Now it's against Israel. What the Lord has spoken against Israel, sons of Israel, and against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Egypt. Way back here. We're talking down here. But this is where he's picking up the story back here. You only have I chosen among the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Israel... You're the only family that I have chosen. You are the premier nation, and you are going to be the premier nation. And I have chosen you and you alone. And because of that, I am going to punish you as a nation for all your iniquities, for all your sins. This is not a new story. The Lord never does anything without warning. Here's the reason why I put this up about Solomon. 480 years to the day they came out of Egypt, Solomon began building the temple. It took seven and a half years to build. Seven, uh, 959, the temple is completed, and Solomon is about to give the consecration and the dedication of the temple. And the Lord comes to Solomon at night, just before it happens. And look what he says in 2 Chronicles 7.12. Most people use this passage out of context. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. It's the temple. Then look at this. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, this is a a consecration of the temple. Shouldn't this be, uh, bless you, uh, Son, and and this is a great thing. No, the Lord's giving a warning here. He's already given it back in the law and back in here, but here, uh, all these years later, 400 something, 487 and a half years later, he's, he's repeating the law and warning them. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour your land. How much have we ever heard about locusts devouring land? I've told you about that so many times. Or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name. How many of you ever heard that, if my people? It's not if. It's and. It's and. It's not an if statement. It's an and statement. The people who quote it, quote, misquote it if they put the word, if my people who are called by my name. It's not if, it's and. Let's back up. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, and if I command the locusts 
to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sins, and will heal their land. Okay, when I sin, in other words, no rain, which we're kind of in that place right now, aren't we? All right? If I, but he's talking to Israel, the chosen nation. He's not talking to us. He's not talking to Egypt. He's not talking to America. He's not talking to Ahabs, the Arabs, the sheiks of the burning sands. He's not talking to China. He's talking to Israel. He says, if I send pestilence, if I send locusts, if I send um, uh, no rain, and when that happens, my people will turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven. Why? Because that's the three things that outlines that he's going to send on the nation of Israel for them to have punishment because he wants them to get back into his, into his uh, loving him because they have, they have messed it all up. They don't even know how to worship him any longer. Oh, they learned over here in the Exodus to learn how to worship him, but they're not worshiping him right now. Back in 801 to 770, they're not worshiping him right now in this time period. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. He'll listen to what's been said in this. If my people will, I will listen if my people will turn from their wicked ways. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, he's talking to Solomon now who he's talking to in the night. If you walk before me as your father David walked, even to do according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with your father David, saying, You shall not lack a man to be ruler in Israel. And that did not happen. Solomon did not stay true like his father was. He immediately allowed all these foreign gods to come in, and sure enough, the day he dies, uh, within a year of the day he dies, the kingdom gets split into two different kingdoms. Rehoboam takes the southern kingdom. Jeroboam takes the northern kingdom. Jeroboam had already been chosen by the ten northern tribes, and he had gone down to, e to Egypt to run because Solomon had heard about Jeroboam already being selected before his death, before Solomon's death, to be the king of the, of the new king of Israel. And uh, Solomon has chosen his son Rehoboam to be the king. And so Jeroboam had run down to Egypt. And sure enough, when the word came out that Solomon was dead, uh, Solomon was going to try to kill Jeroboam, keep him from being the king. And when the word came out, they sent for Jeroboam. He comes back up and starts leading the people. And then the kingdom is divided. Of course, Jeroboam is the one who goes to the... To, um, the people under Jeroboam's leadership go down to Rehoboam and say, well, listen, your father sure did rule over us hard and taxed us greatly. If you'll relinquish just a little bit of that, we'll let you be our king. No, 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 Rehoboam says, you think my father was hard? Just wait till you see what I'm going to do. Sure enough, no righteousness, no good here. Jeroboam becomes the king of the north. The kingdom split. There's no further reign uh, forever and forever uh, through Solomon because Solomon sinned. All right. Well, then Solomon asks, I mean, then uh, Amos uh, repeats seven questions that the Lord has asked. Because the Lord is going to punish Israel. So if you can answer these questions, you know that the Lord is going to be true and he's going to punish Israel. Uh, your notes are incorrect, so follow what I'm saying to you now. I wrote the notes, but I just goofed. I knew what I was trying to say, but I didn't say it right. And so it's confusing, so listen to me and I'll correct the notes later. The first question Amos presents to the people, do two men walk together unless they have made an appointment? And the answer is no. Unless they've made an appointment, they are not going to walk together to make a business decision. And that's what it's talking about. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? The answer is no, because he doesn't want anything in the forest to know he's there because he's looking for something to kill to eat. After he gets his prey, then you hear him roar because he has made a kill. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? The answer is no. It's a sure answer. There's no doubting that this is the way it is. Third question. Does a young lion growl from his den unless he's captured something? The answer is no. There's no yes or no. 
He doesn't want any, the young lion doesn't want any other animal to know that he is starving and hadn't captured anything. He's looking for something. He'd like for something just to kind of walk into the den so he could capture it. Does he roar? No. Does he growl? No. Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there is no bait in it? Does a bird say, oh, there's a trap down there. I'm going to go sit on the little flap thing let it catch me. No, it doesn't do that. You've got to have bait. Does a trap spring up from the earth when it captures nothing at all? The trap just says, oh, I'm going to catch the air. And the answer is no. So the first five questions, the answer is no. It's a sure deal. Second two are yes. Sure deal. If a trumpet blows in a city, will not the people tremble? Yes. When the, when the emergency trumpet, the ram's horn, when it blows, the people tremble. Something's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody's trying to attack us. They tremble. If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? And the answer is yes. You think, oh, the Lord wasn't involved with it. Yes, he was. Absolutely he was. The Lord, he is saying, and he's implying it here, whenever calamity comes on a city of Israel, it's because the Lord has sent that calamity on. Oh, he may use an ungodly people to do it. Because he uses everything he has under his control, which is everything, to do what he wants to get done. So when the northern kingdom, when they're talking to Habakkuk, who said, Habakkuk is prophesying and saying, look, the Lord is sending Assyria. And the people respond and say, oh, surely, surely God's eyes are too pure to look upon the sinful Assyrians who would come and attack us. The Lord God would not send the Assyrians. The answer is yes, he did. He planned it that way. And God's eyes can look upon sin because he created it. He created everything and then he said to the people, okay, my people do these things because these things are the things that I say are holy. Everything else is a sin in your eyes and in my eyes. So can God look upon sin? If God can't look upon sin, who can? If God didn't create it, who created it? Because I want to serve the God who created everything. Everything. Where did it get created? Did the devil create sin? If he did, then he created something. The devil didn't create anything. He's an angel. He can't create anything. You follow me? God created everything so that there would be a people who chose Him to worship Him and He wanted those people, including you and me, to turn away from the things He doesn't want us to do and do the things He wants us to do. The things He doesn't want us to do, He calls that sin. The things He wants us to do, He calls it righteousness. Well, verse 7, Surely the Lord God does, does nothing unless He reveals His secret counsel to His servants, the prophets. Well, he says, look, at this calamity not come? Absolutely it comes. And he's talking about the calamity that's coming. And the Lord is not going to bring that calamity without revealing that secret to his prophets who are told to go and tell the people, this is what the Lord's fixing to do. Fix it. Now, what you have to remember, fixing to do may mean a thousand years or a hundred years or in this case, a little more than 56 years. Just think about it like this. It's in Peter. It's a couple other places. A day to the Lord is as a thousand years. So when the days the Lord says, um, I'm going to send calamity upon you, and it happens any time within the thousand years, that's just happening the same day for the Lord. It's happening today for Him. You thought about that? Oh, with you, we got some nights to go along. But with Him, there's no shadow of darkness, Remember? There is no night for the Lord, for God, the Father. There is no night for the Holy Spirit. It's light all the time because He is the light. There is no darkness. So for some of us, we got to go over nights and we count those in years for some reason. It's going to be over 56 years. He says, look, I tell my servants, the prophets, and they tell you, you are not without warning. A lion has roared. Remember, the thing starts off with that. A lion has roared in Zion. Yes, from the heavens, the lion, God, has roared, and he is going to bring judgment and punishment on this northern kingdom. And when he does it, it's, yeah, it's going to be a half, more than a half a century later, but it's going to happen. You can 
Bet your life on it. You can mark it on the wall. It is going to happen. Who will not fear because the lion is roared? You ought to fear. You ought to fear. Just like the ram's horn blowing in the trumpets. You ought to fear because tragedy is coming. The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Proclaim on the citadels of Ashdod. That's down the Gaza Strip. Those are the Philistines. And on the citadels of the land of Egypt and say, so down in Egypt and Philistines, say to them, assemble yourselves on the mountain of Samaria and see the great tumult within her and the oppression in her midst. Philistines, Egyptians, climb up on the highest hill and look at what's fixing to happen to the northern kingdom of Israel. Look what's fixing to happen to Samaria, her capital city. Look what's going to happen. Just watch. Watch. You enemies of northern kingdom of Israel, come watch what I'm fixing to do. But they do not know how to do what is right, declares the Lord. Talking about Israel. They don't know how to do what's right. Those who hoard up violence and devastation in their citadels. They don't know what to do what's right. They are so far away from God. Oh, they're out there doing their business. Yeah, they're doing their business. They're so God. You know, <clears throat> um, Back in 1970, um, I gotta think of the year now, 77. I went to I went to become the minister of music and youth at First Baptist Church of Pleasant Grove, which is on Loop 12 in Dallas. And 20 years before I arrived there, uh, the church and the pastor had had a fight, and the church was running over 1,500 in Sunday school at that point in time. And the pastor was arrogant about it. And the deacons were arrogant about it. And there was a major split in the church. So they decided to do a vote. So they removed the pulpit. And they took the big old preacher king chairs. You know how we used to have king chairs up there for the preachers? Stood the preacher king chair right there in the middle where the pulpit was. And on the Lord's supper table they put a black box and a white box with holes on top of them. And everybody... Over 900 adults came through and took a blank piece of paper off of the Lord's Supper table and put it in their vote box in front of everybody. It was not an anonymous secret ballot. It's where everyone could see, every adult, every member, come and pick up a piece of paper and either, either put it in the black box or put it in the white box in front of the preacher sitting there so he's watching it all. Black box, the preacher goes. White box, the preacher stays. Over 900 votes were cast that night. Of those who were members and could vote, children and all voted. There were five votes more in the white box than there were in the black box, and the preacher stayed. Do you know what all the other people did in the black box? They did. They went down the road and started Buckner Terrace Baptist Church. A wonderful church. Incredible church. Fabulous church. Marvelous church. By the time I got there 20 years later, they're still dealing with the split of 20 years ago and still up to the same shenanigans. I went as the seventh minister on staff. And within three months, I was the only minister on staff. And get this, I wasn't very old. I wasn't very, I was only 22 at the time. Not old enough to go the next two years without another minister on staff. The preacher built. I didn't know the staff was fighting. The deacons were fighting. Everybody was fighting. They were mean folks. Just mean folks. Today that church has a chain link fence around it because it's gone. Do you know what? Some churches need to die. Because that church was going about all their worship and doing everything they're supposed to be doing. But you know what? They didn't know God. They were just being religious. Yeah, just being religious. Chairman of the deacons lied. Lied to me. Lied to the new pastor that came in. When finally the new pastor came in, lied to him. Lied, lied, lied. Everybody lied at that church. It's a church I really should not have gone to, and I, and I knew when I got there I shouldn't have gone there. I knew. But I didn't know what was going on. I was young. Didn't know. Did not know. Israel's got the same problem. Israel doesn't even know. I'm sure when that church was started in Pleasant Grove, it was a wonderful church. But you know what? It went sour. 
Therefore, says the Lord, an enemy, even one surrounding the land, will pull down your strength from you and your citadels will be looted. Yeah, he's telling. There's going to be a, there's a country that's around them. And by, by the way, it's to the north. And the name of that country is Assyria. And it's going to come and it's going to destroy. He's telling of him ahead of time. It's going down. Israel is going to be destroyed. Thus says the Lord, just as the shepherd snatches from the lion's mouth a couple of legs or a piece of an ear, so the sons of Israel dwelling in Samaria will be snatched away with the corner of a bed and the cover of a couch. The shepherd goes out and says, oh, there's a lion. It's got one of my lambs. Shoe lion. Get away. And he fights the lion away. And all that's left of the lion is a leg of lamb and a piece of its ear. The lion's already got the rest. So it will be with nor the northern kingdom that finally whenever they come in and they fall, it's going to happen in 722, they're just going to barely get out of there with the edge of a corner of a bed and a blanket. They're not going to get to take their stuff with them. Not going to be much left of the northern kingdom. You're going to be surprised in a few minutes when we're going to tell you how many actually left in this fall, how many actually got away. You're going to be surprised. Most of you have never heard this. Verse 13, hear and testify against the house of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Israel, who used to, who, who settled down in Bethel after he came back from getting his wife, two wives, and their two handmaids over there in Laban's country. He worked for 14 years for Rachel, and lo and behold, uh, he had her for about seven, and she had Joseph. And then they left Laban's house with 11 boys. The oldest is Reuben, and he's only about uh, 13 or 14. And Jacob is 91 years old when they leave Laban's house. And he comes back, and Benjamin's not born yet, but Benjamin's going to be born soon. And when he is born, his beloved Rachel will die in childbirth. And then he'll mosey on over to Bethel and he'll build his house there and that will be the place from which he takes his family over to Egypt when the famine happens into Bethel. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, declares the Lord God, the God of hosts, for on the day that I punish Israel's transgression, I will also punish the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and they will fall to the ground. I will also smite the winter house together and the summer houses and the houses of ivory will also perish and the great house houses will come to an end, declares the Lord. What is he talking about? Here we are in this day and time and when the 722 comes, Bethel is going to be destroyed. The ivory houses, the summer houses, the winter houses and all the great houses. What's he talking about? Ah, you see, Bethel was the main place. Jeroboam the first, when Solomon the kingdom divided and Jeroboam became the king of the north, Solomon's son became the king of the south, Jeroboam started in Bethel. And that's where he got his wife from Tyre, and she's a Canaanite woman, and she brought in the god Molech to worship, and they built altars with horns to Molech, they're in Bethel. And then later on, Ahab, wife is Jezebel, built ivory houses there. He's, the, the capital is not moved yet from Bethel over to, uh, to uh, uh, Shechem and then to Samaria. Hadn't happened yet. In fact, we have that over here in 2 Kings 23. Uh, furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel in the high places which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, had made uh, Israel's sin, had made, uh, had made even the altar in the high places, he broke down. He's talking, we're talking about Josiah here. Then he demolished the stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah. Now when Josiah turned, he saw the graves of those who were on the mountain. He sent and took the bones of the graves and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which the man of God proclaimed, who proclaimed these things. Oh, Wait a minute. Amos proclaimed it and Josiah's down here and he goes and overthrows Bethel. This gets fulfilled. He goes and destroys these houses. He destroys the bones. So Amos proclaims it. Josiah, the southern king, goes and does it before the fall of the northern empire. Bef within this 56 year period. Well look here. 1 Kings 22, 39. Now that rest the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory houses which he built and all the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? That tells us who built the ivory houses. And Ahab was living as, and his head of his head, uh, uh, town was in Bethel. 
That had already happened. Well, the houses he built, Amos said they're going to be torn down, and Josiah came and did it. Fulfilled. Prophecy fulfilled. Hear the word, you cows of Basham who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring now that I may drink. He's talking about the real housewives of Basham. <laughs> and I got news for it. If it's the real housewives of New York or of Los Angeles or whatever, he's talking about the same thing right here. These are drunken, sinful, arrogant, women who make their husbands bring them wine and provide for their needs and they will not help the poor. They will not help the needy. The Lord God has sworn by His holiness, Behold, the days are coming upon you when they will take you away with meat hooks, these cows of Bashams, these women, and the last of you with fish hooks. You will go out through the breaches in the wall, each one straight before her, and you will be cast to Harmon, that's the mountain of Harmon, Declares the Lord, enter Bethel and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply the transgressions. Bring your offerings every morning, your tithes every three days. Do what you want. Offer a thanks offering also from that which is leavened and proclaim free will offerings. Make them known. For so you love to do, you sons of Israel, declares the Lord. You notice it's leavened bread. It's not unleavened bread like it's supposed to be. Oh, they do the sacrifices. They do the rituals. They show up and whatever the, the menu, the, uh, supper, the order of worship for the day, they do it perfectly. You know, there are churches out there right now that need to close. You know how to know when a church needs to close? When they have, they have a menu. It's not the menu. That's a bulletin. I'm sorry. In order of worship. And it says, sing all three verses of number 212, standing on the promises. Hymn number 212. Everyone open a hymn book. Everyone turn to hymn number 212. We're going to sing the first, second, and third, first, second, and last verse. And lo and behold, the minister of music only sings the first and the last verse. And it said they were going to sing the second verse. And the people gripe. You didn't sing the second verse. It says you're supposed to sing the second verse. You did not sing the second verse. I hope we don't leave, lose a minister of music over this. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You have been there. If you've, if you've not been in Sagemont all your life, you have been there. I have been there. Put in the, oh, accidentally, accidentally go up and lead a song before there was supposed to be a special music. So you have to change the order and put the special song after the special music so you can sing another one because you did it out of order because you just goofed. And they come and say, I hope we don't lose, lose a minister of music over this. That's been said to me. That, I was him, yes. That church needs to close its doors. Oh, they offer and they do everything. But when they're supposed to bring, be bringing unleavened bread, they bring leavened bread. They don't do it right. You follow? Transgress all you want. You cows of Basham. Over in, uh, over in 2 Kings uh, chapter 19, we learn that there are three uh, attacks on the town of Basham. After that time, we never hear of Basham again, except to name the place where it is lush lawn, lush greenery, a wonderful place, but the town never recovers. When there's an attack, they attack the breaches, and they, they punch holes in the walls, everybody tries to escape, everybody's killed, according to these uh, these are three attacks that happen uh, when it's all said and done. You know what? <clears throat> you can take a church and accidentally start a fire at the church. The church burns to the ground. You come and clean up that church rubbish and take away the slab. And it's really interesting how it only takes about 365 days and there's grass growing. And within about a year and a half, you didn't even know there was a building there. You thought about that? You thought about how temporal everything is if God's not being worshipped there. You can burn it down, think you have totally destroyed it, and just wait. The trees will grow. 
the grass will grow. In a, in a drought like we have now, it's kind of amazing. Seniors helping seniors over here. We went and we cut everything down around this house, and this house had vines growing all the way up to the second floor, up in through the, up in through the uh, shingles and everything into the house. We cut it all down. We got it all down. We cut it destroyed it all. Hit it with Roundup. By the way, don't ever use Roundup without leaves because <clears throat> it doesn't do any good. Hit it with Roundup. Come back two weeks later to just do a few minor little cleanup things. And if those vines have not grown out of the ground and caught onto the air conditioning hosing and wrapped around it all the way to the top of the house again in two weeks. There are cracks in the front yard big enough to lose two Yorkies side by side. <laughs> and yet, and it is so brown and patched, this, this carpet looks better than the scorched grass. But those vines are growing. So it is with sin. So it is with sin. But I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in your, all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Cleanness of teeth, that's a way of saying you're starving. You don't have anything to eat. You, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to clean your mouth if you don't have any bread stuck between it. You don't have any bread, therefore you've got cleanness of teeth. They only cleaned their teeth back in those days. With thing, they didn't brush them every morning. They just got it to get the food out. We didn't, they didn't have plastic toothbrushes back in those days. You got it? So they would use different types of, of branches and stuff they would use. Elijah talks about, Elisha is a fulfillment of this prophecy. Sure enough, in 2 Kings 8, which happens after the Amos passage, sure enough, Elijah comes along and says, look, you go and you do what you need to do because seven years of famine is coming. There's not going to be any rain. There's not going to be any rain. Go do what you're going to do. But take, you need to get ready because I'm telling you, the Lord's bringing famine. Passage is going to be fulfilled. Even though they don't have any food. Even though they can't eat. Even though they are starving, they still won't turn to God. How stupid. How stupid. He tells about that in Amos chapter 4 verse 7. Furthermore, <clears throat> I withheld the rain from you while you were there, where still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain in one city, and on the other city I would not send rain. One part would, would be rained on, the other part would not be rained on. It would dry up. So three or four, uh, two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink, but they would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I smote you with scorching wind and mildew, and the caterpillars of de were devouring your many gardens and vineyards, fig trees and olive trees. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I sent a plague among you after the manner of Egypt. I slew your young men by the sword along with your, your uh, captured horses. I made a, uh, the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Lord saying, look, you're doing all the religious things, but you don't know how to worship me. Not all worship is true worship. And they would not repent. They would not turn from their wicked ways. Therefore, verse 12, Thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. You ever seen that in a Western? Prepare to meet your God, son. No, that, ver that word line comes here. And he's saying it to Israel. Prepare to meet your God. And then he tells about his greatness. For behold... He who forms mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what are his thoughts. He who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. Prepare to meet your God. Prepare. Prepare. The doom's coming. Unless you change and repent, prepare to meet your God. And in fact, since the doom's coming, the Lord says, I'm just going to give you a, a, a dirge. You know what a dirge is? Doom, 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 doom. There's a dirge. And he puts words to it. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She's not fallen yet, but here's her dirge for when she does fall. She has fallen, she will not rise again. And she doesn't. Israel does not return. Southern kingdom returns, northern kingdom does not. She will not rise again, the virgin Israel. She lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city will go, that which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left. 
Okay, 100 out of 1,000, what percentage is that? 10%. And the one that goes forth with 100 strong will have 10 left. 10 out of 100 is what? Okay, so we've got the same thing going here, 10%. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. All right, when the fall happens and Israel is attacked by Assyria, if they go out, a thousand go out, only a hundred will be left. If a hundred goes out, only a ten will be left. Ninety percent of Israel will die in the fall when Assyria comes in and it takes them and, and to overthrow her. Only ten percent of the northern kingdom actually goes into exile. Only ten percent. It is a great slaughter. It is a horrible slaughter. Only a remnant of the northern ten tribes goes into exile. Most of you didn't know that. It wasn't a big group. It wasn't a big group. It was a small group. He says this, in the midst of all this happening, when 90% of the people die, you want to be part of the 10%, you know how to do it? Here's how to do it. Seek me that you may live. The nation of Israel and its leadership are leading the people astray, but if you want to be a person that will live, seek me. There are some churches that need to die. And if you've got people that you know that are churches that need to die and you hear the story, you might say to them, you know what? You might just want to go worship someplace else so that you're not part of all of what goes on. you got arguments in your family. You might just want to bow out sweetly and close your mouth, not be part of that so that you don't get into the argument. Just let it die over there. Let those who want to fight do the fighting. Israel, you want to not, you don't want to be part of this fight and you want to live. And by the way, those who went into exile were treated really, really nice. They went into exile in Syria and they were treated well. Those who went from the southern kingdom over to Babylon, they were treated well. Remember Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego? Oh, after the fiery thing, they were treated well. They led the people. In fact, they led the people so well, and the, and the Babylon allowed them to worship the God Jehovah. Nebuchadnezzar uh, accepted the God Jehovah, came to his senses. By the time they leave, most of them, the Jews stay in Babylon. By the time of Jesus and Paul and Peter, the largest community of Jews outside of Israel or in the Promised Land are over in Babylon. Treated well. Esther, a Jewish, becomes a queen. And we just go down the, the list of things, the blessings. How do you get to be part of that? Seek me that you may live. Do not resort to Bethel. Don't go back and do the things that are being happening over in Bethel. Don't go worship those gods. Don't go worship Molak. Don't walk, his other name is Chemish. Don't do that. Don't come up here to Gilgal and do all the stuff that's happening here. We talked about that last week. Don't go over to Beersheba. Uh, for Gilgal will certainly go... Uh, uh, the captivity in Bethel will come to trouble. Seek the Lord that you may live. When you're in trouble, seek the Lord. They're not seeking the Lord. Calamity comes. They're in trouble. They don't seek the Lord. They do what they think is right. O house of Joseph, and it will consume with a... Um, seek the Lord that you may live, and he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph, and it will consume with none to quench in it for Bethel. For those who turn justice to wormwood... Cast righteousness down to the earth. He's talking about leadership here. He who made Pleiades and Orion and changes deep darkness into morning. Talking about himself. Hangs those stars up in the sky. That, when you look at Orion today, it looks exactly at Orion today like it did back in these days and in this day and in this day and in this day and on back. Hung right where it was. Changed deep darkness into the morning who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. He who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong, so the destruction comes upon the forest. They hate him who proves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks with integrity. That's the prophets he's talking about. They hate them. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them, Though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many and your sins are great. You who distress uh, the righteous and accept bribes and turn aside the poor to the gate, 
Therefore, at such a time, the prudent person will keep silent. The one who wants to live, the one who wants to be part of this 10% in this dirge, to get out of dying, the prudent person will keep silent. For it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates. Perhaps the Lord of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. But only 10% get out. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord, there is wailing in all the plazas, in all the streets. They say, alas, alas. They also call the farmer to mourn. Well, he doesn't have to. The, the, plaza, the, the plaza is supposed to be a place of joy. The farm is supposed to be a place of joy. And yet they call the farmer to come in because there's no, nothing being harvested. And they bring in the professional mourners. Professional mourners. That's like professional prayers. Any of y'all want to join the Church of Christ Scientist? Yeah, you can do that. When you need a prayer, you just call up the line. You, uh, you pay them money over a credit card or over the phone, and they'll pray for you. <laughs> Professionals at it. In all the vineyards there is wailing because I have passed through the midst of you, says the Lord. The Lord's going to bring this destruction, and they're going to be wailing. And they can call in the professionals if they want to the morning and wail. That's what he expects to happen. But guess what? The Lord has come through. Jeremiah talks about that. Same thing when it happens to the southern kingdom when he talks about them calling the mourners and the women to come mourn and everything. And then the Lord backs up. He says, okay, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're thinking about now, you Israel, northern kingdom. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord. For what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? They are talking, they are thinking that the Lord is talking about the day of the Lord. Now they already know about this. This has already been prophesied. They know that on the day of the Lord there will be destruction and when it happens Israel's going to become, or the nation, the Jewish people to become the premier nation of the world and never have any trouble again. That's like our snatching away or the Latin word rapture. The church is longing for the rapture. You don't want the second coming to come because you're not going to be part of it. You want the rapture to come or the snatching away. As a church, that's what we want. What does Israel want? Israel wants the day of the Lord to come because that's the day when the Lord fights the battle for Israel and all of Israel's enemies are defeated and they have no enemies anymore. It's called the second coming. It's called the battle of Armageddon. He says, since you're thinking about it, let me answer you on that. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, what purpose is it for you? It's no purpose to you because this day that's coming that Amos is talking about is not the day of the Lord. This is the fall of the northern empire. Here's what the purpose is. It will be darkness and not light. As when a man flees from a lion and from a bear meets him, and when a bear meets him or goes home, leans his hand against the wall and a snake bites him. He's able to get away from the bear. He's able to get away from the lion. He goes home and goes, oh, man. Wasn't that good boy? That was, a, that was a close call. Oh! And a snake bites him. In his own home. <clears throat> Will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? That's what it's going to be. Won't that be the way? Yes, that's the way it's going to be. Israel, I'm not talking about the day of the Lord. I'm talking about the day that you're going to fall and I'm going to punish you. The day of the Lord is for something else. I hate, I reject your festivals, not, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. That would be terrible. You're going to church. You're having your parties, your potluck luncheons. You're coming on Wednesday night. You're fellowship around the tables. You're having Bible studies with your teacher that goes way too long every Sunday morning. Because <laughs> it's called a Bible study hour, not a Bible study 15 minutes. We've got an hour and 15 minutes for this time, and yet the Bible study you sing and, and fellowship for most of the time, and the Bible study for 15 or 20 minutes. No, we, here we do the, we, we go 49 to 55 minutes every time we meet. It's a Bible study hour. That's the reason we call it that. You do all that. And you think you're doing your godly thing for the day, and you go worship, and you sing your songs, and you stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, amen, sit down, I'm a fat. Say a word of prayer, Baptist. You know, to sit down after every prayer, right? That's right. Stand up for the word, reading of God's word. Okay. May the Lord bless this reading. You don't even have to say, sit down, folks. You all sit down anyway. <laughs> and you've done your righteous thing for the day. Wouldn't you hate for God to say this to you after doing that? I hate. 
I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sounds of your harps. Yeah, I love you, Lord. I love you. Yeah, yeah. That's all about you, folks. It's not about the Lord. It's all about you. Your hand waving, your showing, your jumping. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Go take a dance lesson. <laughs> dance right. Show true homage and worship to the Lord. Show true reverence. Do you know how you worship the Lord in the Scripture? Follow me, David. I'm going to the floor. <laughs> True worship of the Lord is like this. Amen. The rest is praise. If all you do is praise and listen, you haven't worshipped. If it, you haven't bowed your head, you haven't worshipped. If you haven't sought him privately without screaming out his name, and I'm really going to hit some of you on this one, or talking to the devil in the midst of your prayers. Lord God, I thank you've done this, and Satan, I just bind you. Why do you talk to Satan in the middle of your prayers when you're talking to the Lord? Why? Think about that. Why? Shaky ground. I hope we don't live, lose a Bible study teacher over this. <laughs> Verse 24. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Let it flow. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offers in the wilderness for 40 years? Absolutely they did, O house of Israel. Absolutely they did. They learned how to worship here. You also carried along with you Sekurath, your king, and Kion, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. What in the world is he talking about? That's the god Moloch with a different name. That's the name Saturn. All the way back, whenever Solomon gets his wives and she brings in, the first wife brings in the false gods, and when Jeroboam gets his wife and they bring in the false god Molech, that is the worship of the god Saturn. And the image, when they make that god Saturn, and they carve that image, and they dig out a little hole in the wall, and they stick that little god up there that they have made, so they can bow down and worship. Oh, you worship a god? They even worship Allah five times a day, but he's no god at all. Well, isn't that interesting? They're worshiping Saturn. They stick in that little hole in the wall. That's The image is called K-I-Y-Y-U-N. That's what that image is called. But it's god Saturn. You bring that along with you. And that's the star of your God because the star of the God of the Israelites in that point in time was the God Saturn, Molech, Chemosh. Same name, same person, same entity, same false God. Therefore I will make you to go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord whose name is the God of hosts. As long as you keep doing this, if you don't call upon my name, if you, don't, uh, if you don't turn from your wicked ways, Israel, leadership of Israel, if you don't turn, you're going to exile. Did they turn? No. How do we know? Prophecy fulfilled. Went to exile. Done. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today. It's not preaching, Lord, because we're not sharing the gospel. We're studying your word to find out what has happened in the past and what will happen in the future. We're Bible studying today. But whether it's preaching or it's Bible study, may it pierce our hearts that we turn to you. Oh, I know the promise there in First Chronicle, in Chronicles is, is for Israel. But we, may we not be guilty of living as Christians and worshiping as Christians and yet not bowing our knees to you and following worshiping you. May we not be guilty of bringing a, a, a bad offering to you, an offering of whatever praise, of whatever worship, of whatever 
uh, thing we think we ought to be doing. May it be what you want us to do, an offering you will accept. Lord, we ask for your blessings in your son's name. Amen.